Um, so just to jump right in, I know there's been a change to the Aisha time, so it's at 8.45. I want to end just a couple minutes earlier so that we uh, respect the, the, the Salah and give people time um, to make the Jama'ah. Huh? So uh, to jump right in, um, again, two weeks ago we started the class, we talked about rights of the parents and the subject and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents it in the Qur'an with this link to Iman. Spoke about the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and um, and the importance of the righteousness of the of parents. And the hadith about fafihi ma fajahid. We discussed that last week about the man coming to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, asking him uh, to be with him, to make hijrah, to pledge allegiance, to fight jihad with him, and yet he told him, "Are either of your parents alive?" And we discussed that and the importance of it. Um, and then we ended on the. Uh, the discussion of how to speak with them. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us uh, to speak to them qawlan karima, to speak to them in an honorable speech. What is the definition of that? And we mentioned the Tabi'i scholar Sa'id ibn Musayyib who said that it's like to uh, speak as a, as a, um, uh, 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 like a meek slave who has committed a crime with his harsh and majestic master. Um, and, and then I went into the discussion of, of advice, but, but before that, let's talk a little bit about the word uff. So as I mentioned, one of, the, uh, one of the group of ayahs that we can work towards memorizing, if we haven't already memorized them, is ayah, the ayahs in Surah Al-Isra 17, 23 to 25. It's in just uh, three ayahs, it really sums up the essence of Birul Walidain, um, the, 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 right, the, the respect and the honor of the parents. <clears throat> and so one of the things that are mentioned in that Quran, uh, or in that, in that ayah, is that we should not say uff to our parents. Now the, the word uff, it was a word that the Arabs had used um, to, to signify disgust, like uff, like I, I, I don't like that. And it's carried over still in modern days, Arabs still use that. In fact, there's other cultures as well that use that as well, right? They'll say uff, I believe in the in, in, uh, in, in Urdu speaking cultures, they say uff. Are there any, like in, uh, in Afghanistan, do they say uff? Yeah, so it's pretty much a universal uh, word. Um, so that's one thing to know, that the, the actual word uff, but it's also, it's not, it's not just the word uff. So for, especially our children now who are growing up in, in, in a society, or even if they grew up in a society where they say uff, the principle behind uff is anything to signify disgust towards your parents. So what would be an example, like in our situation here, living in America, what is a way that a person signifies disgust. What is a sound or a word that they make? Whatever. Hmm? Whatever. Whatever. Right? Now whatever is even actually what whatever. Three syllables. Oof is just one. So whatever is actually it takes a little bit more uh, uh, energy to say. What's something that's even a little bit less? Jeez. Right? Or whatever. And even that we should we should remind ourselves and other people that where does that come from? Where does people, when they say, geez, where is that coming from? Jesus. Jesus, right? And we have respect for Isa alayhi salam and all of the prophets. When we say their names, we say alayhi salam with them. So we're not going to shorten their names and we're not going to say them when, you know, out of disgust. You know, even though they're not disgusted with the prophet, the fact is you don't want to mention that prophet's name in a state when you're in a state of disgust. In fact, the, the prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he told Aisha radiallahu anha, he said, I know when you're angry with me. And how did he know that he, she was angry with him? How did she know? How did he know? She would not take, take his name? She wouldn't say his name. She would, if she wanted to swear, she would say, Warabdi Ibrahim, by the Lord of Ibrahim. But when she wanted to make a qasam or an oath to, for emphasis, and she wasn't up, you know, just upset with him, she would say, Warabdi Muhammad, by the Lord of Muhammad. So he picked up on this, that she and she said, "You're right. I didn't. I never wanted to speak your name when I'm feeling anger towards you." The name of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And you know, in a lot of cultures, and this is across the Muslim world, there's a hadith. The soundness of those ahadith we can discuss it, but the ahadith talk about encouraging people to name people by the name Muhammad. Now, 
regardless of the status of that hadith, the end result is how many Muhammads do we have? Muhammad Ahmed. In fact, I joke, if you're in a Muslim country and you're trying to call somebody, you know, just say Muhammad, Ahmed, you know, Mukhtar, you know, a few different of the, of the common, uh, common names. But one of the things that I found is that m Muslims will have Muhammad or Ahmed very frequently as a first or middle name. How many people have met a brother and for years they called him by a name and they then they realized his first name is actually Muhammad? Anybody ever have that experience? And so you're like, oh, your name is... But so they'll give the name Muhammad so that they get that honor of having the name of Muhammad وسلم, in their household. And yet growing up, they won't use it. And I think it's out of edda because you could imagine a parent, if they get mad at their son, and there's like, you know, it's better to say something like, you know, Khalid, instead of like in that state to, to yell at the child with the name Muhammad. Now, if you have a child who, and I'm not saying it's haram, this, nobody's saying that. It's just you're, you see this etiquette, this edad with the, the name of the Prophet وسلم, in speaking to him. And this started with Aisha. Okay, so other things that we find like, huh, just that sound, right? Just make, huh, or rolling your eyes, right? People roll their eyes. Um, so any little action to signify disgust or frustration with the parents is haram. Because the Quran says uh, uh, to not say even uff to them. And in explaining this, the Prophet Muhammad said in a hadith that لو علم الله الشيء أدنى من أدنى if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew uh, of a word, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ilm uh, encompasses everything, if he knew of a word lower than uf, he would have mentioned that. But because amongst the Arab, the, the least, like the, 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 the baseline, the, the, the last of the things that could be said, the most basic was uf, that's what he said is prohibited. Don't even say that to them. Now, um, one of the things they mentioned when they discuss usul, there's a, there's, a, there's a concept that not everything is mentioned in the Qur'an. So we're talking about the rights of parents. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever in the Qur'an say, don't hit your parents? In the Qur'an. Those of you who have read through it or heard it. Have you ever heard a discussion like an ayah in the Qur'an that says, you know, don't hit your parents? It doesn't. And it doesn't need to. Because it's min babi awla. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that saying, uff to the parents is haram. Then everything else in speech and in action is min babi awla. Even more, uh, it, it, like if, if I tell a person, um, you know, um, don't step foot in that house. If I said just don't, don't go to the house. And they're like, well, what about the bathroom? Can I go to the bathroom? Like, well, I already told you, don't go to the house. And so, well, what about the bathroom? Well, you have, you know, you, 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 you it's, it's implied. That the things that are that are that are even worse, you, we should not do. Another very interesting hadith about the word uf is the Prophet وسلم, said that on Yom Al Qiyamah, a person will come to have their deeds weighed out, and they'll weigh out all of their good deeds on the scale of good actions, and then the angels will bring one little piece of paper that they wrote down uf just once. And they'll play, place that statement of uf on the scales and it'll outweigh all of that large amount of good deeds. <laughs> the large amount of good deeds. So this is, he's, 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 he's showing us, even though this is the, 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 bare, the, the least thing that we can do to disrespect our parents, but even in that, it's a, it's a, huge, it's a big deal. And so this is, this is especially important in, in now in modern culture where the respect of the parents has, is being lost. And one of the signs of the Day of Judgment is the intishar of Rabu, that disrespect of parents in all of its forms, from those extreme cases that we hear about people who do things to their parents, you know, and wind up in jail, to people just speaking to their parents, you know, calling them by their first name, saying boof, and doing this publicly and nobody even batting an eye about this, the, this type of disrespect. Now this doesn't mean that we don't, as children, speak up to our parents, uh, if we think that there's a, there's, a, there's a need to it. It doesn't mean that we create a, a, an authoritarian system where like, hey, you can't say anything to me because any back talk to me is oof. In fact, tonight in the, in the halaqa, what we're doing with the, with the boys is we're going through Surah Al-Anbiya. Not all of the Surah Al-Anbiya, 
But one of the main purposes of the boys' halaqa is to instill in them the values of how to be a man. Now what greater role models on how to be a man than the prophets? And how, what a greater role model amongst them than the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So we're going through the seerah of a, of a few um, of the prophets and we chose Surah Al-Anbiya uh, and we, we decided to, to go through the, ayah, the, the, the prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned in Surah Al-Anbiya rather than all 25 that are mentioned in various portions of, of the surah and to go in the order that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned them, not in chronological. Because I was actually suggesting, okay, we're gonna go in chronological order, and somebody else said, well, if we're gonna use Surah Al-Anbiya as the baseline, let's go in the order because there's, there's always a, a secret to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is placing things in a certain way, in a certain order in, uh, uh, in that, and there's a wisdom. So we went, and tonight they're discussing the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and specifically when he spoke up about the idols. So the skill that we're teaching them is to be able to speak up and be assertive when you see something wrong, just like Ibrahim alayhi salam saw something wrong and he spoke up, that you should also do that as well. And in preparing the, the curriculum to, to train the counselors for tonight's session as they're working with the, the young men and the boys, one of the things that it talked about is as parents, you should encourage, we should encourage our children to, to speak up, but to do so in a respectful manner. And so they mentioned there's three types of, of the way people deal with situations. When they feel wronged, or they feel that something is wrong, they either go quiet, just silence, or they speak aggressively and out of anger. So it's either you know passive or aggressive, or sometimes you know people do passive aggressive. But we're, but the skill that we we're inserted, uh, um, uh, encouraging them is to be assertive. So, so say what you need to say, but do it in a respectful manner. And this is in another section of the Qur'an. Um, we see one of the Sahaba who became Muslim. And his mother told him, this was in the Meccan period. His mother told him, if you don't leave Islam, uh, well, actually she ordered him to leave Islam. And, and what she did, she didn't just summer son of Mecca. And if you, has anybody been to Mecca in December? In December, like in the winter time? Isn't it hot in, in December? So imagine what, how hot it gets in the, in the summertime. So, now I don't know what time of year this occurred, but we know Mecca is always hot. So she said, I'm going to go out into the sun, and I'm not going to seek any shade on my head. I'm not going to comb my hair. I'm not going to drink any water. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit out in the sun until either I die, and that's going to be a miserable death, right? Or you leave Islam. And so this Sahabi was, uh, there was ayahs that were mentioned about that, that in Jahadaka, if, if your parents strive to try to get you to do shirk with Allah, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us to do? Don't obey them, and then what? What? So don't obey them, and speak to them the Qawr al that we were talking about. Speak to them in a nice way. And so just look at the, look at the, 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 the mubalagha in the situation. This is not a situation where the parents are just giving them bad advice or even telling them to do something haram. This is, the parents are telling them to do the worst thing. And, and in jahadaka, it didn't say if they just tell you, if they're really striving, if they're struggling to get you to do shirk, don't obey them, but speak to them kindly. And, be, and befriend them in a good manner. So this is, so, and we find in the Quran, um, and uh, Muhammad Malut mentions this also in the way we call out to our parents. So there's two sto stories in the Quran where Ya Abati is used. What's one, of, what's one prophet who called out to his father and said Ya Abati? Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, and? Not Ismail. Did Ismail said, "If I met Tuma, okay, so yeah, okay, so Ismail as well. So three, and then Ibrahim and Ismail and Yusuf alayhisalam. Now, in the case of Ibrahim speaking to his father, look at who he's talking to. Yusuf alayhisalam speaking to his father. Yusuf alayhisalam is Al Karim ibn Al Karim ibn Al Karim, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi called him. The Honorable, the Son of the Honorable, the Son of the Honorable. His father is Ya'qub alayhi salam. Whose other name, does anybody know Ya'qub's uh, other name? Israel. Israel. 
And so this is talking about um, respecting the names of prophets. So even though the country that we all know, I mean, I can't say love, but the country is called Israel. Some of the modern ulama have said, you should be very careful about cursing Israel. Right? Even though, because in their heart and the way it's used, we understand. It's, we're not, and again, we're talking about adab. We're not talking about adab haram. We're talking about just to have adab of the name of this prophet whose name was Israel. If you're going to curse the country, you know, don't, don't put the curse in the name of that because it's, it's, an, it's a name of a prophet. Israel is the name of Yaqub. Yaqub was a prophet. His father Ishaq was a prophet. And his father Ibrahim was a prophet. But when it's, uh, uh, Ibrahim. Uh, um, Yusuf السلام, he's a prophet speaking to his prophet, he says, Ya Abati. When Ismail, who's a prophet, is speaking to his father, who's a prophet, he says, Ya Abati. And when Ibrahim السلام, is speaking to Azam, who is an idol maker, and has called him to, to, to lead Islam and to, to worship idols, and not only called him, he says, he says, if you don't do this, what am I going to do to you? I'm going to throw stone, I'm going to stone you. In fact, that part part of portion of the story with the younger kids, we, we took it out. We just said, you know, because you could imagine like the first graders, you know, like the father's telling the son, if you don't leave Islam, you know, so we said, okay, we're not denying it, we're just delaying that to a, a later time. But look at the look at the, the status. Here is a prophet speaking to Azam, who's an idol worshiper, calling him to kufr and shirk, and he's saying, Ya Abati, oh my father. The same word that the other two prophets spoke to their fathers who were prophets. And so this is this is how even in the worst scenarios we still maintain all of the adab and all of the ihtiram, all of the respect and all of the, the etiquette with the parents. So that's a little bit about uff um, and to uh, and to get it off of our off of our tongue. I'll tell you a funny story. In Mauritania when I studied there, they said there's a place in the capital city called Souk Uff. The marketplace of Uf. I said, why is it? They said, because it, they sell, they, that's where they have a, a fish market and all of the, the fish and the rotting fish, and so it stinks. So one time I got out of a taxi and I didn't know where I was in the market, but as soon as I stepped out, that smell hit me and I was like, Uf. I was like, oh, this must be the place. <laughs> and it was. Super Uf. Um, so. Last week we talked about giving advice to the parents in both deen matters and dunya matters, but to lower the wing of humility to to them. That even if they're doing something haram, that we should we should uh, advise them. But unlike other people, that we can we can mention it even if they get angry with our parents. We should take a little bit more care, as Imam Malik mentioned when he was asked about this question. Do we do amr bil ma'ruf and nahi anil munkar to our parents if we see them doing something wrong? He said yes, but lower waqfil lahuma janah janah dhulni min rahmat. As the ayah says, uh, lower the wing of mercy. Basically, be humble when you when you do that, and also to teach them, and then not to raise their voice, not to raise your voice above. Them. If they're speaking, to to uh, to not. Uh, uh, to not raise uh, your voice above them. Uh, and then Muhammad Maudu says, so two things, to not raise our voice above our parents, or to our parents, speak respectfully, and then to not call them by their first name. To not call them out by their first name. So to use things like Baba, Dad, Yabati, uh, whatever, you know, Abu, uh, a title of, of respect. And if your kids sometimes, who's ever had a kid like just try it out, like try, like kind of push the limits and call you by your first name? Who's had that as a parent, right? And how does it feel? You take them back. What's that? You get, you take, you take them back. <laughs> it, oh, so yeah, yeah. Right. it doesn't feel right, yeah. right? It doesn't feel right. So as much as we love our kids, and there's a there's there's something about maintaining certain titles of respect, especially in that scenario. Now, one of the things you'll see in amongst the Sahaba is that if they were speaking about their parents, they might uh, refer to them by their first name. So, so this doesn't mean that all the time we have to say, you know, my Baba, you know, he, he did this. This is only when we're speaking directly to them. Uh, but if we're speaking about them. We could use the title and we could also use the, the first name. And again, we're talking, this is all about etiquette and adab. So don't, this is not a discussion of halal haram. This is this, uh, also about the etiquette that, has, that, we're, that we're drawing from the, the Quran and the Sunnah. And then another thing Muhammad Mulud mentions, He says another aspect of Biru Walidain, respecting the parents, is to make dua 
for them. And because the ayah in Surah Al-Isra says, فَلَا تُقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْرٍ Then what? وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا إِمَّا يَبْلُغَ الْعَنِيدِ No, before that is, um, is the, also the وَقُلْ رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا so there's a list of, of, of things that Allah is mentioning in, in that of what to do and what not to do. And one of the things he says to do is to say, And he mentions قُل. It's an order. So this, whenever we see an order in the Qur'an, it could be an order of obligation. There's actually multiple, um, uh, there's, there's, other, uh, there's other orders that we find in the Qur'an. And this is, this is one, one, one time where I like to show some people have a, uh, a feeling that, oh, I can just go to the Qur'an and open the Qur'an and read it and derive rulings. And so one of the things I asked them, I said, uh, according to the Arabs and the use of the Arabic language, how many different types of amr did they have, orders? And how many of those do we see in the Qur'an? Most people don't. When we study usul, we find that there's more than 14 different types of amr. There's some amr, there's some orders or commands where it's uh, you're actually an invitation. So, for example, we look at the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, when the angels came and they were on their way to destroy the, the Qawm Lut, uh, and what did he say to them? Ala ta'kulu, you know, come and eat. He was ordering them, but do you order a guest to, to eat? No, it's, it's an order of, uh, of, um, of, of respect. Um, it's like when a guest comes to your house and you're like, eat. You're not ordering them like, come on, it's time to eat. It's, it's out of uh, ihtiram. There's other orders, they call it sayrura. Kunu qiradatan khasi'in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the people that broke uh, some of his rules, like the Sabbath, the Sept, and he says, be monkeys. So it's an order, not like, oh, they have to act like monkeys. It was an order that was given, and they were turned into monkeys. Um, there's multiple other different uh, types of orders. So this is what the usuli does when he's looking at the Quran. He says, what kind of order is this? And if it's an order of action, or it could be an order of permissibility, kulu wa sharabu. Right? In Arab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, eat and drink, wa la tusrifu, and do not be wasteful. So there's three orders in there. Eat, drink, and, be, and do not be wasteful. Now, eating and drinking, do we have to eat all the time? Because the order says eat. So does that mean, oh, I'm a Muslim, Allah said eat, so I'm going to just eat. No, it means... It's a it's a amr of ibaha. It's permissible. You may eat and you may drink, but when he says wala tusrifu and do not be wasteful, that's an amr bin wujub. So that's that's an order of of, of obligation. I don't want to turn this into a fiqh al-usul class, but this is these are the things that we we come across as we read uh, the the Quran. So when Allah subhanahu wa taala says wa qur rabbil hamma kama rabbiyani sabira, say. This is an order for obligation that we have to, at least once in our lifetime, make dua for our parents. And as I mentioned in the first class, some of the ulama said that actually we should get into the habit of making dua for them at least five times a day. Just like we pray five times a day to show thanks to our, to our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and he told us, he used the word shukr, anashkur li waliwari He says, show thanks to me and to your parents. And he didn't include anybody else in that order. So we show shukr to Allah by praying five times a day. Some of the ulama made the ask me the analogy that it's also uh, that we make dua. But at least we do it. At least we do it once once in our life. And you can do this like if you don't do it after every prayer, because sometimes if we just say okay, I'm going to work on getting it done throughout the day at some time. When we pray five times a day, that's a time like you know you can kind of put those in like okay, at least after fajr I'm going to make dua for my parents. And what do you have to say? Question. It's my birthday, and I don't don't know if this is accurate, but we see Rabbana wa ta'amdu wa shuk. At that time, to make dua at that time? Yeah, yeah. Is that a good time? From Rukur? Yeah. Okay, so the question was. Hmm? So you make you shuk. Oh, Rabbana wa ta'amdu wa shuk. So that was shuk. Okay. At the same time. So you heard somebody say that? I, I don't know if that's accurate. Okay, so he, uh, the brother said that he heard somebody say that when you're coming up from Bukur, uh, that it's a time, since you're doing hamd and, and saying, you know, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thanking Him, that it's a time to make dua for your parents as well, or dua in general? 
Okay. As far as my my understanding, there, there there's there's certain parts of the prayer that we do tasbih, and there's certain parts that we do du'a, and the du'a part is in the sujood. So even like after you finish Fatiha, it's not from the Sunnah to say, okay, I finished Fatiha and Surah, let me make du'a. Even though du'a is great, but from the, the way the Prophet ﷺ, the way he prayed, his du'a was in sujood. So he didn't even do du'a in the ruku'ah. He did tasbih in the ruku'ah, and he did tasbih in sujood, but he also did du'a either uh, in the sajda, or between the sajdas, or after the, 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 the tashahud and the tahiyyat. So those were the three places that he did uh, he did du'a, or at the very beginning, according to some ulama like uh, Imam Shafi'i the, and Abu Hanifa, the, 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 uh, well that's actually the fana before, the, so the du'a is just in those places. Yeah. Is, that's as far as I know. Is Bitter an exception to that? For the Qunut? Yeah. Yeah, so those situations, uh, like the, the, um, the places where we make du'a, if we're following the way the Prophet made, where he made du'a, so, uh, <clears throat> In the Qunut, whether it's in the Witr prayer or in the Fajr and the Subah prayer, that's a place where we, we see, oh, the Prophet, he did dua after um, after um, the Surah, right? But that's the only place that we heard. So we don't find, we don't say, okay, let, let's, I'm in prayer, let me make dua after Surah. He didn't do it in other prayers, and it was a, the, the Qunut was an exception. Uh, so to get in the habit of, uh, of, of doing the dua for, uh, for the parents, And just the interesting thing, I, I, I'll share this with you. When I, when I heard this, I was, it made that element of the prayer, Rabbana wa laka hamd, or Rabbana wa laka hamd, um, uh, that much uh, more impactful to me. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, he used to make it a point that he would not only attend the jama'ah with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he would not miss the takbir to the ihram with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's how adamant he was to pray with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One day, for whatever reason it might be, he, he got delayed. So he missed the takbirah of ihram. He came into the masjid, and, and as he's going, he knows he missed takbirah to ihram, the opening takbir, but he's saying, I can't miss a rakah. I can't miss a rakah. When he got to them, he found them in rukur. He found that the jama'ah was in still rukur. So, and we've all had this situation, right? We come to the jama'ah late, we see him in rukur. What's your feeling? What do you feel? Hmm? Make what would you say? What would you say if you get like just what would be an exclamation you might make when you're rushing to the jama'ah? You thought you lost the rak'ah. They're still in rukur, so it means you can still catch that rak'ah with the imam, right? What would you say? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So that's what Abu Bakr Siddiq said. He was so happy that he's going to catch this rak'ah with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Before that instance, the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was to come out of every motion of the prayer with takbir. If you look at the prayer, the entire prayer, every motion is Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, except for Sami'a Allahu Liman Hamidah, and um, uh, Sami'a Allahu Liman Hamidah, that was, that's, that's uh, uh, oh sorry, it used to be Allahu Akbar. That's how he would come out of Rukur. While he was in Rukur, and a Siddiq radiallahu anhu said, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent revelation to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sami Allahu liman hamida. Allah heard the one who made his praise. Sami Allahu liman hamida, Rabbana wa liman hamida. So that was changed for, uh, it's almost like a, a commemoration for us in every single prayer of, of the Siddiq radiallahu anhu and his closeness to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, so this is the last section about speech, and this is a very interesting section, it's a good, good way to end, and then next week we'll pick up on how to do respect with our body, and what bir do we owe to our bodies. So uh, he says, um, in terms of responding to, to the parents, there's, there's, a, very, uh, there's, a, there's a, a hadith where there's a man named, it could be uh, translated as George, this is a hadith. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in hadith, Sahih hadith, that there was a monk from amongst the people of Bani Israel, and his name was Juraj. Anybody ever heard of the story of Juraj? Yeah. So Juraj was a rahib, was a, was a monk, and he was in his soma, in his monastery, and he used to, as a monk would do in his monastery, uh, cut, off, cut himself off from the world and just engage in worship. And one day he was in prayer, and his mother came to the door of the monastery, 
of the little house that he was in. And by monastery, it could just be a one room or a two room house. A soma'ah could be anything. In fact, the Prophet said, Ni'ma soma'a, the ni'ma soma'at al mu'min baytuhu. How wonderful the monastery of a believer is housed. Now, we also know the Prophet said, La rahbaniyyata fil Islam. There's no monasticism in Islam. But what that means is we don't take that complete cutting off. We don't leave marriage, leave buying and selling, you know, that type of monasticism. But in terms of, you know, we all have that feeling we come home after dealing with all of the, the hustle and bustle of all the, the dunya and seeing things. And when you walk through your house and you say like, at least like a friend of mine said, I know, he, he lived in the UK. He said, I know I live in Darul Kufr. I'm living in a, in a non-Muslim land. He said, but at least my house is Darul Islam. My house is the abode of Islam. So you come in there, you feel this, this uh, you know, we should feel attached to our homes and not have this consumer drive like, oh, we gotta go somewhere, we gotta go somewhere. We, you know, we, uh, it's easier to make wudu, it's easier to make your prayer, it's easier to make sure that we're, uh, we're eating halal because we're in control. We all know the situation of being in a predicament, oh, prayer's gonna go out, I need to make wudu. Prayer's gonna go out, where can I pray? I need to eat, and there's no halal place you know, for me to go. So when you're at home, it's, it's, a, it's a good monastery. So Juraj's mother came, comes to the monastery, and she says, yeah, Juraj, she calls out to him. He hears her, but he's in salah. And so he says, Ya Rabbi, Ummi wa salati. Oh Allah, my mother and my prayer. He's, he doesn't know, who do I answer? You know, if, if you were in salah, and your mother came to you and called out to you, says, Ya Ahmad, Ya Muhammad, and you know, she's calling out to you, what do you do? And so Juraj didn't know what to do. So he chose to continue in his, in his prayer. The next day, his mother comes and she makes the same call. She says, Ya Juraj. He's in his prayer again. Ya Rabbi, Ummi wa Salati. O, o, o Lord, my mother, or my prayer. And he makes his decision in the prayer. I'm going to continue on in the prayer. And he does that. It, it makes her mad. Now, as a parent, you know when you call out to your child and you know they're there. And that's why, you know, that's in the, in the Shah, Imam you Noah know, mentions of this. It's like, it's not a, it wasn't a situation where his mother's like, oh, maybe she's not home. This was a situation, she knew he was home and she was calling out to him. So you know the feeling as a parent, for those of you who are parents, you call out to your child, you know they're there, you know they can hear you and they don't respond. How does it make you feel? It's, right? Because we sacrificed a lot to bring him into the world and to raise him and to take care of him. So I'm just, I'm just asking for you respond to me, to let me know that you can hear me. So what does she do? She makes dua for him. And this is where it's really important to, to realize as a parent, the dua of a parent for their child is what? It's mustajab. Allah will respond to it. And remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't, uh, he doesn't say, I will, I will, re I will respond uh, to a dua if you ask for something good. What does it say in the ayah? Ud'uni. Right? Call on me, I will answer you out of his generosity. Because what did the shaitan do? What did he ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he refused to bow to Adam alayhi salam? Right? Give me some time. You got it. He made dua. He asked Allah and Allah is generous. Allah gave him the time. So Allah will give. So even if, so, so for the parent, if they make dua against children, and how many of us have heard a parent, not necessarily not a parent, so we're not exposing our own parent, but a parent gets so frustrated and angry, and just like, bam, they make a dua against their child. Well, this is what happened. So she said, in her dua, she said, may you, and I know there's children in the, uh, the audience, and within your shot, so I'm gonna speak in code. And I think everybody will understand. She said, may you not die until you look into the faces of ladies who have a not so good profession. But okay. So Juraj goes on in his in his life. Bani Israel get together and they become jealous at one point, a group of people from Bani Israel become jealous of, of Juraj. And this aspect of Hasan, you see it in a number of times. In fact, they try to they try to, to lodge a scandal against Musa Ali Sala. A similar thing. And they they killed some of their MBA, and they had hasad uh, for the uh, against the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he came. When they're like, oh, we were waiting. What were they? What were the Bani Israel doing in Medina, in the middle of the desert? That wasn't their language and culture. They were waiting for the last messenger. Well, when he came, and he's a Qurayshi Arabi, 
Beni Ismail, not Beni Israel. They're like, no. We, and so it was Hasid that drove them away from it. So Hasid, the, the jealousy is a very, very powerful disease of the heart. So they got jealous of, of Juraj and they said, we want to create a scandal and mess up his righteousness. They hired, uh, they, they asked a, a woman of this profession to, um, to, to seduce him. She tried, failed, went out, found a shepherd, did what she did. Nine months later, she comes and she has a child and she says, this is the child of Juraj. So now they say, okay, now we have proof we can go to Juraj. So they pull Juraj out of his out of his little monastery. They demolish his monastery, and they say, "We're going to punish you for this crime." And so he said, he, because he was he was flustered. He's like, "What did I do? What did I do?" They said, "You did such and such." And so he looked at her, and he said, "Did I really? Are you saying this about me?" And she said, "Yes." And it was at that point the du'a of Juraj's mother came true because she said. Don't, may Allah not let you pass from this earth until you look in the faces or the face of such and such. And in another narration, there was a few of them standing there, so it was the faces. So he said, okay, let me pray two rak'as and I will, um, let me just go pray two rak'as. So he prayed two rak'as. And this is a proof that salah, as we know it, two rak'as, or you know, multiples of two, was, was part of even the previous ummahs because he said, let me go and, and pray and make wudu. Sorry, I don't know if he said in the hadith two rak'as. I have to take that back until I, I check with the, the, the text. But he said, let me make salah and wudu. So Imam Nawawi said, this is a proof that wudu was something the previous nations uh, had as well. He made wudu, he went to the child and he said, oh child, who is your father? Now this is an infant. And so the child, and at that point, they went, they started hugging Juraj, they started patting him and and asking for forgiveness and saying, we're so sorry, we're so sorry, please let us, we're going to rebuild your monastery. And instead of rebuilding it out of mud as it was, we'll rebuild it out of gold. Because now they dealt, they realize they're dealing with somebody who's not the average person. So that's the, that, that's the end. He said, no, just rebuild it with mud as it was. So that's the story of Juraj. In an explanation of this, the Prophet ﷺ said, he said, this servant who was a sincere worshiper of Allah, so again, look at, look at the, the, the impact of a, of a lack of respect of parents. It's not just for bad Muslims, right? Was Juraj a bad Muslim? He was a worshiper, cut off, focused on the worship of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One slight mistake and big punishment came for him because he didn't follow the, what he should have. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if Juraj had knew the sacred law, if he was a faqih, he would have known that he should have answered his mother. And, uh, 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 and not just stayed in prayer. So now the ulama say, okay, how do we do that? How do we answer our mother prayer? And this is where the discussion comes in. I know it's almost Isha time, uh, but basically, if you're in prayer, according to some of the ulama, uh, uh, they said the way you answer your, your mother in prayer is you say, subhanAllah, you do dhikr, or you raise your voice in prayer so that she knows, or the, the father knows, he's in prayer. Because that's the only time that, you know, if it's, uh, if it's other than that, you have to stop what you're doing and respond to them. Oh, mom, you know, why didn't you answer me? Because I was in the middle of this game, or in the middle of my homework, in the middle of my project, or if we're an adult. I was in the middle of, uh, you know, for us as, as adults, you know, if we get a text or a phone call from one of our parents, that's like, especially WhatsApp, because they can see the little blue checks. They're like, I know you saw my message. <laughs> didn't respond. So we got to be, in fact, sometimes if I'm in the middle of a, of a halaqa and... Uh, I usually turn my phone on silent, but if I see a phone call coming in from my mother, that's the only time I'll actually pick up and say, I'm in the middle of a dust. Anybody else? You know, it's gonna have to work. So, uh, we respond to the mother, even if it's in the prayer. <coughs> Some of the ulama have a difference of, a difference of opinion that you can't do tasbih. I'm not going to get into the, the fiqh of it, but many of the ulama said that if, if your mother or father call out to you in prayer, do dhikr, like say subhanallah, because there's a hadith that says, man nabahu shaykh fi salah, fed you sabbih. If somebody wants to make a, get a message across in the salah, then do tasbih. Is Qari Hamad leading the salah tonight? Or is there something else? He is here. Yeah, okay, he is here, all right, I'll just. Um, and um, and so that's what we do. We either we do tasbih, raise our voice in the in the qira'ah, uh, and in any case, hurry up the prayer. Now, they mention an interesting. This is a fifth discussion, but it's just an interesting. It's, it's interesting to know. They said if you're in the fart prayer, do you cut it off if you know that even in responding, like they want an answer, 
uh, or I'll get into that discussion if the imam has, uh, has arrived. We'll pick it up next week. Jazakallah uh, khair for attending, and uh, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.